so much for being here to launch this report, estimating and describing the UK impact investing market, uh, a partnership project between the Impact Investing Institute and EY. It was in the autumn of 2019 um, that the Institute was launched here in this room with a mission to accelerate the growth and improve the effectiveness of impact investing in the UK and internationally. Uh, a lot has happened since then um, that underscores the vital importance of the mission that we're driving. The growing acuity of the climate crisis, the pandemic, and obviously, as of this week, war. But amongst all of that gloominess, there is some uh, many reasons to be cheerful about. Um, and not least the growing recognition by financial services and by the investment community that they can become contributors to solving social and environmental problems. And today's report describes that vibrant and growing market and showcases the role that an intentional investment community committed to delivering social and environmental outcomes can play. So we're really excited um, for you to engage with the report, read it, um, and we're very grateful for those who have funded it. So in particular, the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, who've been a long-standing um, supporter of the Institute's work and our vision for building the field of this finance. So we're really grateful, um, not only for their support, but for the Minister of Sport, Tourism, Heritage and Civil Society, Nigel Huddleston, MP, who's going to kick off proceedings today with some remarks about the field. Thank you. So good morning everybody and uh, thank you for that introduction uh, Sarah and for inviting me to speak today at the launch of this uh, very uh, important report um, and it's a pleasure to be here uh, and I should say first of all well done for everybody making it here this morning I have to say I thought I was going to be speaking to an empty room and going back to the bad old world of online only um, because uh, it's been a real pleasure for me to get out and about again given the various bits of my portfolio after what's been an incredibly difficult time and of course unfortunately as you mentioned Sarah we're in rather difficult times again for different reasons but I, I really do appreciate so many of you um, being here today and I look forward to working with you um, over over the coming uh, months and, and and hopefully years uh, uh, of course you all know that uh, ministers suffer uh, reshuffles every now and again uh, so I only took on the civil society portfolio last September from Diana Barron who I know many of you know uh, very well but I have to say it's been a real eye-opener for me in terms of the scale and the impact and this report really brings that home as well uh, today uh, and of course, uh, here we are, uh, Toynbee Hall, absolute trailblazing example of social activism at work, uh, helping people who are exp experiencing disadvantage and hardship. And this remarkable, and I do mean remarkable institution, has a really proud history of helping others out of poverty. And it's a very visible example of the kind of impact all of us in this room are trying to create. Uh, but not every community in this country, of course, is lucky enough to have a Toynbee Hall. Um, and the problems go uh, quite far. Um, economic prosperity, job opportunities and strong social fabric are not equally distributed across all parts of the country. We all know that. And this means that many communities suffer from poor connectivity, uh, low levels of community engagement and a lack of community spaces and infrastructure. And levelling up uh, is trying to address these problems, uh, but it's an ambitious agenda and the challenges we face are of a scale not really seen for a long time, and government cannot tackle this on its own. So large-scale investment is needed to provide safe and affordable housing, training opportunities for young people in particular, and fast broadband to power our growing needs for connectivity. And investment is also needed for issues close to my heart, such as access to sports facilities, creative opportunities, heritage sites, 
and services delivered by the broader civil society network. And when I talk about the tremendous amount of resources needed, I don't just mean money. I'm talking about the expertise, the skills, innovative thinking that is needed to create a society that we all want to live in. And of course, those very skills are showcased very well in the room today. And that means that all of us, government, civil society, and the private sector, all have a role to play. And as our world changes, so do the attitudes of people, of businesses, and investors. And more and more, they are looking for ways to be part of the solution to challenges such as inequality, poverty, and climate change. And increasingly, the question being asked is, how can we work together on this? And I firmly believe that the defining challenges of our time must be addressed through people, communities, and sectors working together. And at its heart, impact investing is all about partnerships. It gives investors a way to build thriving communities by supporting businesses and projects delivering real impact. And it also shows that delivering this social value does not always mean forgoing profit. The UK is home to many innovative, dynamic social businesses. I believe you will hear from uh, two of them, probably seven more later this morning. Uh, Lighthouse Children's Homes is a charity which has used investment to power its ambition for equality of opportunity for children in care. And The Good Club is an innovative startup which has benefited from investment to achieve their mission of reducing food waste and they're making zero waste, sustainable groceries, simple and accessible for people around the country. These are just two examples uh, we are lucky enough to have in the room today. But there are many other businesses which offer investors the chance to deliver real impact alongside financial returns. And impact investment is a win-win for everyone. That's why the government has worked with the private sector over the past two decades, actually, to nurture this market. Since the early 2000s, we've set up the Dormant Assets Scheme, which has so far released over £800 million towards good causes, and you will have seen that we recently extended that scheme. It took a fair bit of my time over the last few months getting that through Parliament. Um, and using some of this funding, we set up Big Society Capital and the UK's social, uh, the, as the UK's social investment wholesaler to get money moving. We set up the Access Foundation to make sure that affordable finance is there for organisations that need it most. And we pioneered the world's first social impact bond. We kick-started the community finance sector and set up the first tax relief for social investment. And in 2019, DCMS supported the setup of the Impact Investing Institute. And the reason was simple. It had become clear that there was so much more to do. The amount of money aspiring to make the world a better place was quickly growing. And what was once a niche idea was moving very much into the mainstream. There was, and still is, more to do to enable this money to have its greatest impact. And the commitment of the UK government has moved the dial on creating what is now a world-leading market. Now, this is, the, this is the moment in time to capitalize on this success. We've built the market infrastructure, we, we've got investors who have a genuine desire to be part of the solution, and we have local investment opportunities which can deliver profit, profit with purpose. And this report demonstrates that now is the time for the market to take a leading role in creating a country that we all want to live in. The report, which the Impact Investing Institute is launching today, shows that impact investing has the power, scale, and momentum to deliver on this and more. The findings are profound. The amount of money invested with impact has grown significantly. Investors plan to increase their commitment to impact, and they expect others to do the same. And I believe it's important that investors feel able to play an active role in contributing to pressing challenges of our time, such as addressing regional inequalities. And this report shows the extent to which they are already doing that, and I think there is room to grow. So the social value that impact investing creates can be seen all around us. Some of us might have come across it this morning on the way to the event. Uh, it could be through buying a coffee uh, from a socially conscious outlet. Uh, others might experience it through the renewable energy used to power their homes. Um, or it could be through the dedicated health and social care services that many of us have relied on over the last two years in particular. 
And impact investing can act as a powerful catalyst by investing in projects in our communities which have a clear and visible impact for people and for our planet. I was delighted to take on the Ministerial Responsibility for Civil Society, as I said last uh, September, and championing um, impact investing with all the immense benefits it can bring. I'm really grateful for the work that you all do to keep this market growing and evolving. And I would like to say a huge thank you for everything you have already done and in advance of all the things that you are going to do. Uh, and I really look forward to working with you in achieving these ambitious goals. I'd like to give particular thanks to Dame Elizabeth Corley, Sarah Gordon, and the rest of the Institute team, as well as delivery partners, Ernst & Young, um, for producing this benchmark study. Um, I hope you will find it as inspiring as I have. And I have to apologize, I will be here for the presentation uh, of, the, of the report, but I have to leave uh, shortly uh, after that. But I will be keeping a very close eye on developments. And as I said, I really genuinely look forward to working with you and understanding and getting to know you much better over the coming months. So thank you uh, for listening to me today. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much, Minister. We appreciate those words of support and the picture that you paint of the thriving uh, impact investing sector, which is now going to get some numbers on it. So I'm very excited to invite up on stage um, Penny Frowling. Um, Penny is a partner in financial services strategy, but more pertinently for me on this project has been an amazing partner um, in creating this report. The team at EY have uh, ridden pillion with us on this task and Penny is one of a number of people who've been instrumental in making this report. So now she will have the task of revealing uh, the report, the number and the work that we've been doing over the past year. Penny, thank you. Thank you for that introduction, Sarah. <laughs> Um, and thank you very much to the Institute for giving us the opportunity to collaborate with you over these past seven to eight months. Um, the scale and scope of this report is the first of its kind in the United Kingdom. It's very much the first stage of a journey um, that will have many more steps. Um, we're not the first to attempt market sizing. Um, BSC actually has been sizing the impact market for the past 10 to 12 years. Um, this study takes a slightly different lens um, to inform a broader view of what is happening with impact. So let's, let's take a look. I have to turn pages and click slides, which is... Um, challenging my coordination this morning. So how our journey began. Our journey began um, with the fact that significantly, there's significant attention and interest now in deploying capital for good and deploying capital for impact. This has been driven by a confluence of factors over the past 18 months in particular. So things like COVID-19, um, the Black Lives Matter movement, the level, leveling up policy, which the minister um, just referenced, COP26, and the call to begin evidencing just transitions. So it's not one, but a multiplicity of factors that are making capital far more conscious. There has been a, a call to arms by major players in the financial services sector, um, obviously Mark Carney, but many more, who are calling upon the financial services sector to um, play a very significant role in impact and the deployment of capital, and that the financial services sector has a significant, important role to play in influencing just, just transitions. The UK is a well-known global financial center. It's one of probably three prominent financial centers in the world. It has a vibrant impact sector. We know they have a, a, a vibrant impact sector. However, we don't really know how big it is. The Australians, the Italians, and the French all have sized their markets. Gin has sized it at a global level. But for such a prominent financial services center as the UK, not having a, a clear handle on the number here in this market was seen as a big gap by the Institute. 
And the institute went about saying, well, we need to redress this, graph, this gap. And the destination is we need a baseline of the impact sector in the UK, and we want a rigorous evidence base for how we derive that baseline. So to do that, Sarah and Sarah and the Institute asked us three seemingly very simple but deceptively simple questions. And these questions are, well, how big is it? How fast has it been growing? How fast do we think it'll grow? Deceptively simple questions when you consider the starting point of, of our journey in the context in trying to plan our journey to deliver what the Institute asks us to deliver. So there's some very fundamental challenges. Um, specifically, definitions of impact vary significantly. And as you all well know, there is significant amounts of passion when it comes to impact investing and socially responsible investing. And there are many different views about the definition of impact, all of which are rigorously argued with significant amounts of passion. So getting some kind of alignment on definitions is important. So for example, GIN has sized the impact market globally at about 790 billion. Um, the IFC, the International Finance Corp, also undertook a global market sizing and came up with a number about two and a half saw times bigger than that at about 2.1 trillion. So that shows you the different lenses wh which one can apply to come up with very different numbers as part of the challenge. There's massive data gaps. Um, the industry fundamentally is completely undocumented. There are no standards. So these are almost Odyssean proportion um, challenges to overcome. So what did we say? Well, effectively we had to build an engine um, to crank numbers through it, and then we had to source inputs to make that engine go. And we said, all right, let's approach this like an engineer, and let's say we're gonna have some design principles for building that engine. And there were five different design principles, which were, we need to pick a very commonly accepted definition for investment that everybody can pin their, their colors to. We need a cornerstone data source that everybody recognizes and cup can buy into to the extent that anybody 100% buys into one single data source. Um, we were going to have to triangulate to fill all the data gaps. Um, and we need to make sure that we had, to some extent, um, statistically significant or adequate number of data points that would hold water. So that was where we began. Oops, sorry. Whoa. Sorry. <laughs> See? That just totally wrecked my flow. Live, live. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. We'll get to that number in a minute. Okay, so in the spirit of you've got to get started somewhere, there were three anchor points. I know, sorry, you're laughing at me. You deserve to. Um, <laughs> um, there are three anchor points to how we anchored our numbers. And these anchors, you have to consider lenses um, because they inform literally um, how you build the numbers up the source of numbers, all that good stuff. So the first um, anchor point was we use the GIN definition, and that has to meet the three very important criteria of intentionality, measurability of social or environmental impact, and financial returns. Again, this is a deceptively simple definition, but what, we have, what, what happened as we went through our numbers is there are many um, investments along the capital continuum, whether it be you know, impact aligned, um, that spectrum of capital, um, sustainable, responsible investing. Some of those, those categories, while, they, while they're large and they're growing, they don't meet the definition of impact, particularly socially aligned bonds and things like that. So they fell by the wayside when we applied this definition. The second cornerstone was the investment association data. It was published, it's, it's as of the year 20 to 21. What that data does is it's, it's 74 of the top players controlling 77.9 trillion of assets in the UK. Um, they were the source of data for this. The implication of this is these numbers are anchored in the investment managers. So these are the people that receive capital from places like pension funds, endowments, DFIs, high net worth individuals, that capital is deployed to this, this group, and then they deploy that into end destinations. 
Now, there are fundamental caveats around using IA, um, the first of which is because it's anchored in assets and assets under management and investments, it does not include bank lending, which comes from a diff di completely different source and again is completely undocumented. Um, the data is as of 2020, which some people are saying, well, is that stale data? Um, it is the most recent data available, so we're very confident with that as a source, but it did come with those kinds of limitations. So very important to um, think about these three anchors as we look at the numbers, which I flashed at you very selfishly, <laughs> but now we're going to say. So based on this definition, everyone, the number that our models came up with and all of these anchor points came up with is 58 billion that meets our GIN definition of intentional, measurable, and producing a financial return. Well, now, how did, how did we get here? As I mentioned, we had to basically, guys, build an engine. Um, and then we had to source all the inputs to put into this engine to produce the numbers. So very simple formula at the top. So investment association numbers times the percent that's impact, the rule of thumb they use is 0.5%, which we challenged and queried throughout our process. Then what we did is to address the challenge of not duplicating, meaning counting multiple mutual funds or OICs or things like that, we um, deduped and we modeled to get rid of um, any investment that wasn't direct. And by direct, what we mean is either private or publicly traded um, debt or equity. So it's, it's not money that is invested in funds. There was many debates, as Sarah can, um, <laughs> Sarah can attest to, for how we modeled this and how we made sure that we were not duplicating. So we had to take a modular approach, again, to adjust for the fact that there is very little data. Um, we had to create the data. So the first module was based on IA, but also multiple other data sources, including ONS. We also looked at how um, Jin does it, and the Australians, and the French, and the Italians, and how, how they modeled it as, as well. The second thing we had to do was, given there wasn't sufficient granularity, we looked through several hundred key investor documents, annual reports, AGMs, prospectuses, to look at and validate particular funds and their allocation to true impact to validate. So that was that very bottom-up secondary analysis. We, have, um, we did a survey, which I will canter through in a bit, and then what we did as the final stage was extensive series of workshops and interviews to validate, triangulate, and sanity check the numbers and where they were coming out. So it was a very systematic process that we built up to come to that 58 billion. So where, who, who are the major actors? So this is known as the famous waterfall chart. These are all of the actors within um, the investment management sector. Not surprisingly, the majority of assets that are going to impact are controlled and allocated by the investment management sector. So <clears throat> we have folks from Schroeder's here. These are the big names you know, um, in the industry who are managing and deploying capital. Um, the next is the insurance sector, um, so well-known players like Legal and General, who you know well, and the PE and VC sector. Big society capitals, um, their 6.4, 6.5 billion market sizing is spread throughout these, these, um, these different areas. And there's a specific category, which is a social impact investor, social property, which also reflects big society capitals number as well. So this is the ramp up for how you get to this um, 58 billion number. Okay. So let's take a look at some examples. Now you have to look at this very much as an ecosystem. And many players um, not just receive capital, but they invest capital directly. They could be capital owners, capital managers, and capital deployers. So a couple um, good examples of how this actually works. So the first is Fred's Provident. Um, who is, has an independent charity that then gives money to Snowball. Daniela is here. Um, she's going to be able to talk very eloquently to this. Um, but they deploy capital, they give it to Snowball, and then Snowball um, has a series of investment themes that they invest um, Friends Provident Foundation capital into. 
M&G has five billion earmarked to private enterprises um, with three key investment themes of climate, healthcare, and inclusion. And recipients typically include things like specialty finance houses that provide lending for affordable housings, which is a key impact investment theme, um, as we all know, well know, and is one of the, the foundations and starting points of impact here in the UK. Um, the last one is very important. Um, this is a slightly different um, player. So Yorkshire, um, the Yorkshire Pension Society, 10 billion of assets under management, is deploying portions of that assets under management, 1%, to socially, um, socially impactful destinations, particularly reuse of housing. And um, as part of the important impact initiative to increase the amount of capital from council pension funds, we'll be increasing their asset allocation to that 5% point um, through direct investing. So these are all really valuable, valuable, but very different examples of how you see these actors deploying capital and the important ecosystem that has grown up around, around impact. Okay, so our survey. Um, the GIN survey, GIN and where their numbers are derived is all survey based. They do it globally, which enables them to get to some extent um, uh, slightly more statistically significant numbers that one can get comfortable with. We used a survey here and actually our starting point um, when we embarked on the journey is we were hoping we could you know, use a complete survey based bottom up primary research methodology. The problem with that is just the sample sizes and getting response rates. So what we did is we used this primary research as a means of filling in data gaps and answering questions that simply are not, there's no publicly available information. So um, we had a universe of 240. I think we must have sent, you know, I'm saying 650 emails. I think it's probably double to triple that. One of my team members is here, Peter, who managed, Peter's in the back, who managed this process. I mean, hundreds of emails going out and chaser. We wound up getting 51 respondents, um, 10 of which were disqualified because they weren't truly impact. And we had 41 you know, respondents to this survey who answered a very lengthy questionnaire of about 78, um, 78 questions. Lesson learned, we probably need to, um, to shorten it next time. Um, important lesson learned from this though was that we had a universe of people who were clearly impact investors, but they came back and, and told us that we're not really impact investors, so we're not gonna take your survey. So even then you have some issues around definitional issues, are we truly impact or just impact aligned? So we learned a lot, um, learned a lot from the survey and gleaned a lot from the survey. Hmm? Hmm? Last time I clicked too hard, I revealed our number too fast. So anyway, survey respondents, a couple important things. So where are you deploying capital? Um, what instruments are you using? So not surprisingly, the primary destination is private. It's primarily private debt and private equity. And then about 20% is going into public equity in the form of you know, publicly traded companies and their, and their stocks. A big barrier that is um, traditionally cited to impact investing and in ESG is um, the old chestnut of these, these products or these, these destinations don't perform very well. Um, I think our, our survey and our conversations are putting paid to that in that um, the overwhelming majority, 75% plus, indicated that the investments that they have made are hitting targets or, or exceeding targets. There's a little bit of a caveat just in the sample size and the fact that 11 of the respondents are pure impact investors. So there's more work to do on the financial returns for a whole host of reasons. However, indicative um, is what we're hearing is doing good and investing for good also produces um, good returns and target returns. So that sacrifice um, is, is going away, which is a tremendously beneficial thing um, for the evolution and, and growth of the sector. Whoops, okay. Um, views about future growth. So if you remember two deceptively simple questions that the Institute asked us, has it been growing and how fast will it grow? Um, the majority have said that it's been growing between about zero and 10% over the past few years. Um, 
projected growth, people are saying that there will be significant growth acceleration um, over the next three to four years. Um, and that we're seeing a significant shift in this, this 10 to 20 percent per annum and 20 to 30 percent per annum. We're seeing a very, we've seen a very significant shift where m many more people, um, at least 30 percent more, are seeing a 10 to 20 percent growth over the next couple of years. They're seeing that that new capital will be coming from investment managers, family offices, pension funds, as we mentioned, as well as the, as well as the bank. 75% of our survey respondents have said that they will increase their um, asset allocation by at least 10%. So, you know, the, a little number times a big number becomes quite a big number when you think about future growth. I am going to skip over this. This is drivers and levers. This is a very busy slide, but thinking about how we are going to um, how we're going to stimulate growth, there are some things that we need to address. And our, our respondents said the things they worry about the most that we need to help on, um, that need to be evolved further, is one, you know, simply more instruments that meet a variety of risk profiles. Two, reporting standards is absolutely critical, and the data factor is absolutely critical. Minister, you mentioned the fact that we need more professionals coming into the impact space. That was also something that was cited by about 75% of respondents, is that just, we need more investment professionals coming in, dedicating themselves to impact as a destination for capital. So addressing these issues will unblock significantly more capital flows. And I said I wasn't going to go through that slide, but I did. Um, so continuing the journey, so some parting thoughts. Dialing ahead, um, hopefully we'll all be in this room five years from now. And what will we be reporting? Some things we hopefully think we'll be reporting is our respondents projected that, you know, we'll see a 10 to 20 percent increase in impact. That would bring the um, scale of impact just from this report in these lenses to about 100 billion. We think there's going to be um, a much bigger number, however, because as we um, evolve, as we perfect the way we report, as we spend more time gathering more data, the numbers will increase, particularly as we crack the nut of bank lending, which is unreported. Um, as we see pension funds and are able to count pension funds who are investing directly, and as we see many more players investing capital into the sector, particularly ultra high net worth individuals through family offices. Um, this will be enabled obviously by more data. Um, this is just the beginning of a journey. Um, farmer innovation and investment vehicles, we're seeing a lot of that. Um, and we're also seeing you know, socially responsible bonds, socially linked bond, green bonds. We'll, we see a lot of the data of that. We'll flip those from impact aligned more into impact because we'll be able to see that the intentionality is demonstrated and there and documented. And a parting thought is, is the role of the UK um, and the importance of the UK as a major financial center and a beacon for impact given the scale of its investment and it com its commitment and prominence has a very significant role to play as a leader. Um, and we really look forward to um, continuing the journey with all of you and collaborating um, more in the future. So thank you very much for listening. Um, and thank you again for the opportunity and a special shout out to my team um, for all their hard work on this. Thank you so much, Penny. Really appreciate, as I said, your partnership and um, that canter through what's a very complex um, report. So thanks to EY and again thanks to DCMS and also Big Society Capital for their support of this project. We're really keen to bring some colour to these numbers um, to help the audience here and at home think about the people and the impacts that under, underpin the 58 billion, which now we're at licence to say, a bit a good early flash from Penny of that. Um, and that's 58 billion pounds worth of lives changed, of poverty reduced, of affordable housing units built, of um, nature conserved. Um, so 
to help bring colour to this work. Um, we are going to have a fantastic panel who I'd now like to invite on stage. Um, so if you guys could all come up, and while you come up, I'll introduce you. So we've got two investors with us, Daniela Baron suarez So Daniela's been a leading figure um, in impact investing for the last 15 years, and today she's CEO of Snowball Impact Investments, um, a manager with an impact fund that has already had a bit of a shout out, invested across two interconnected themes of social equity and environmental sustainability. And over the past five years, they've managed to deliver impact and market rate returns. We also have Simon Bond with us. Simon is Executive Director of Responsible Investment Portfolio Management at Columbia Threadneedle. Um, he's been Portfolio Manager of the Threadneedle UK Social Bond Fund since its launch in 2013, um, as well as the Threadneedle Lux European Social Bond Fund launched in 2017. And as I've heard you say many times, Simon, bond by name, bond by nature. Um, and we've got two social entrepreneurs with us as well. So we have Emmanuel Akpan Inwang. He is a former teacher turned social entrepreneur and is founder and director of Lighthouse, an organisation set up in 2017 with a pioneering approach to working with children in care and creating children's homes where children can thrive and last but not least, Ben Patton at the end, a serial social entrepreneur. I think when do you get the name, the, the moniker serial? I think it's when you've done at least two. Um, uh, founder of Farm Drop and The Crowd and today speaking as co-founder of The Good Club, um, an online platform for zero waste grocery shopping. So just in terms of format, I've got the pleasure of discussing the state of the market with this group for 45 minutes. Um, then I'll invite Penny back on stage uh, to join this panel for a 20-minute q and I've realised we might be down a chair. We may need one more chair. Um, um, and we'll open up to questions from the audience. Um, and, um, and obviously for those in the room, we'll come to you. And also for those of you on Zoom. Um, so please do put questions in the Zoom Q&A. They will be, um, uh, they will be, we'll, we'll come to you at 10.25. So that was a big preamble. Sorry about that. Um, to the investors, Daniela and Simon. So hearing Penny's overview, having read the report, um, does the growth tally with your experience of the market and who do you see as the new players coming into this field and driving this growth? And that's to Daniela first, please. So yes, impact investing is the new kid on the block in a way for, for, for this level of volume that has been on the, on the block for 20 years. <laughs> so basically it's a long time coming to become an overnight sensation. However, I think the, the, the 58 strikes me as, as very I mean, great to hear how robust it was, mm. uh, the work. And it strikes me as true in terms of the, you know, the fact that it represents about 1% or less than 1% of total assets under management in the UK, which tallies with the global number, which also represents less than 1% of global assets under management. And for me, that is the, the number that is a call to action. Mm. Uh, because despite the fact that it's growing fast, despite the fact that now everybody's talking about it, there's still a lot to do. There's still a lot to do especially if we are using this as a tool for achieving the SDGs. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, I mean, I couldn't agree with you more on the call to action. I think Simon's just wrestling with his mic. So if someone could come up and support Simon with his mic and we'll go to Emmanuel next, or is the sound? I'm pretty loud, but I don't know if my mic was on, was it? Yes. Okay. Daniela, you're coming. <laughs> I think the women on the panel are coming across crystal. Is, is mine on? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Doesn't look like it's on me. I can talk very loudly. Oh, that's yeah, good. Oh. Simon, you're on. <laughs> we try to silence yes. you, Simon. That's all right. Um, <laughs> in, so impact Simon, investing. Yeah. Um, when Big Issue came through the door at Columbia Threadneedle <laughs> 10 years ago, um, Impact investing meant something slightly different. It meant that you had to sacrifice financial returns in order to achieve it, and it also meant that you had to measure it, which thankfully hasn't changed. But that has um, fundamentally changed over the 10 years, and particularly the over eight years that we've actually been running the fund. If you look in the report, 
90% of the respondents say you don't need to sacrifice or they don't expect you to sacrifice mm. financial returns. So that, that image has changed. You can have your cake and eat it. You can achieve financial returns and you can do good for society, for the environment, etc. So I think that's fundamentally where we've come from and where we've got to. In terms of the size of the market, I think the my market, the bond market, is developing the type of technology that is actually a use of proceeds which is delivering impact. Now the report doesn't necessarily identify those types of bonds, but I was judging some of these bonds um, for uh, some awards. Um, one in particular, the World Bank in association with UNICEF, is targeting education with its use of process, mm. uh, proceeds. So education, the younger demographic, etc. But it's particularly focused on the post-pandemic provision of education finance. So that's how specific you can be. We've got gender bonds and blue bonds and all these other sorts of things now. They didn't exist. If you think back to the Climate Awareness Bond of 2007, the first green bond issued by EIB, then the 2014, the green bond principles, 2017, the social bond principles, sustainability link bond principles from 2020, this market, in terms of its ability to, de to deliver impact through a conventional asset class, is growing exponentially. Total amount of issuance in those types of bonds over a trillion last year, 2.5 trillion in total um, across the globe. And the UK, as a proportion of that, has moved from 3% to 4% of that particular market. Why has it done that? Green gilts are issued. Two green gilts were issued last year and then the subsequent issues that followed that. So we've actually managed to achieve a 1% increase on a 3% base. That's incredibly inspiring and obviously the Institute was closely involved with pushing for those. I'm sorry, Indeed. thanks Simon for <laughs> allowing us to talk about that, um, to advocate for green gilts with reported social co-benefits. So, and the oversubscription on both those gilts was really significant as well, tenfold with the first issuance, sixteenfold for the second issuance. So. There's a huge appetite that's reflected in this report. But, you know, investors are one part of the equation, but investors are partnering with enterprises to actually deliver these impacts. And I think you touched on there, Simon, you know, impact investing is a broad universe and that is detailed in this report. There's um, the sort of social investment wing, which may still be concessionary and has to be giving um, loans, repayable finance to charities and social enterprises, and that's an invaluable part of the ecosystem, all the way through to these sort of massive multi-billion pound funds that are coming on stream. So I wanted to come to you first, Emmanuel, and just talk about where do you sit in this broad universe and what is the role that social investment has played as you create your incredible, very inspiring organisation? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly where we, we sit, but we have been um, the recipients of two broad types of um, social investment. It probably helps if I set some of the broader context around um, what we're doing and why it was so uh, critical to us being able to deliver our impact. So, um, as Sarah said, Lighthouse is an organisation that's committed to improving outcomes for looks after children. We do that by setting up um, children's homes. And the reason why is because the outcomes of children in children's homes in the UK are some of the poorest in Europe. We have about 8,000 children who grow up in children's homes. Only 4% will get five good GCSEs. Um, about a third will be homeless within two years of leaving the children's home, typically at the age of 16. They're 15 times more likely to be criminalised than their non looked after peers. Um, I spent a number of years um, researching children's homes, trying to find out why we were having these issues in the UK. And that research took me to Germany and Denmark where outcomes for children were much better. And when I returned from Germany and Denmark and doing that research in 2018, what became clear to me is that we needed to set up an entirely new type of children's home. Um, we needed to address a number of the issues that we saw in the sector, one around um, staff and um, recruitment and retention. Retention rates were really poor. Um, typically, people don't see um, working in children's homes as a viable career option. So homes themselves were often quite uh, institutional education too often was an afterthought and we didn't really have an evidence-based way of doing things they were able to solve a number of those problems we knew how we could we could go out and recruit train and retain great people we knew that we could have a real a really great focus on uh, education and therapeutic care uh, and we knew that we had a really great model of practice which we were importing from Germany and Denmark the real challenge was how were we going to be able to go out and get all of the money and resources needed for a building. Um, I certainly didn't have it uh, myself. 
Um, we did start a process of applying to a number of quite tr uh, traditional social investors, so we went after that sort of um, finance, but we encountered a number of barriers. First of all, we were an early stage organisation with no track record, um, so lots of social investors saw us as not being investment ready. Um, I didn't have a background in the sector or somebody who was committed to improving it, but ultimately my main career before that was being a teacher and I wasn't particularly well connected in this space, didn't necessarily understand it. Um, we did have the benefit though of having a really um, early uh, grant funder called the Tree Bed Trust. And after a number of conversations with them, what we realised we could do was to unlock some of their endowment. What's really interesting about um, the report is that it's, it's talking about the um, impact investment that's um, available. Um, but I, I think that, that that 58 billion figure may well be um, quite conservative because when we consider just trusts and foundations in this country, the top 300 trusts and foundations have 65 billion uh, in endowments. Um, much of it sat in banks not necessarily making a great deal of interest. So we were able to work with the Treebid Trust to unlock £2 million of their endowment. That gave us the money that we needed to buy um, uh, a building and refurbish it and turn it into what is now a state-of-the-art uh, uh, children's home. You can go along to uh, the Lighthouse website and take a, a tour of that. It's an absolutely um, a, a incredible building. Um, the agreement that we have with the Treebid Trust is that they continue to own the building and we pay them rent at a proportion of our revenue, um, which is great for um, us as an organisation. Um, we were also able to work with the Postcode Innovation Trust and they gave us a mixture of grant funding and social, low cost, um, low interest um, social investment as well. And that provided some of the additional funding that we needed to um, refurbish the building and also get started as an organisation because we couldn't just run on, on social investment, we needed some grant funding as well. And by working with those two organisations and those two different types of social investment, we were able to set up um, what is now um, a state of the art children's home and hopefully demonstrate how a new model um, of running children's homes can improve the outcomes of children um, who grow up in children's homes. Really, um, thank you for that overview, Emmanuel. And it's, it's that's just a perfect example of the role that, you know, um, that on the social investment wing, patient blended finance can play in unlocking really pioneering innovation <laughs> for the most vulnerable people in the UK. So. Um, thanks. Thanks for the work you do. <laughs> um, and Ben, you're a bit further on in the growth of your social business. And so can you tell me a little bit about the role that impact investing is playing um, playing for you in the Good Club? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm not sure if we're, we are that much further along. Um, <laughs> to be honest, it sounds like amazing work, an amazing project. Um, so just for some context as well, our business is trying to solve the problem of grocery uh, waste packaging and packaging waste in groceries um, the impacts uh, are not uh, that well understood but it probably accounts for 30 to 35 percent of all plastic pollution um, which in turn accounts for uh, around three percent of um, carbon emissions um, or the, the the carbon budget on on current projections so uh, when we were looking for finance, I guess we, uh, in the early stages, we were looking um, to work with a mixture of angel investors and um, some specific impact funds. Um, just a little bit more on, on, on what our solution is. So we, the approach we took, and we've actually uh, experimented with different approaches. So we, we now provide a solution where we uh, send people their groceries in packaging that's reusable. So when they receive an order, we collect the packaging from them, clean it and, and reuse it. So there's quite a lot of innovation risk in the whole process, just exactly what the proposition was to start with, um, who, what market we connect with. Um, the, there are a lot of um, cost lines that weren't understood. So with um, a more traditional class of investment, the, the cost structures would be better understood, but I guess for, for a lot of early stage businesses, you don't quite understand your business model until you're a long way down the line. So there were three um, impact investors um, that, well, there were three that we've worked with over time, two initially, a, a fund called Mustard Seed and another fund called Sustainable Ventures. So I think Mustard Seed described themselves as a micro VC, um, but um, with a focus on, um, with a, with a focus on impact and they talked about lockstep investment so a combination of commercial and impact outlook 
And so for them, uh, it was a very natural fit. I think one of the, the difficulties in the engagement initially was trying to work out what, um, how they would judge the success of our enterprise from an impact perspective. So clearly the commercial, um, the commercials were, were, were easier to understand um, more broadly and compare, but um, how, how would they uh, look at us as, a, as an impact investment? Um, so there's, there's a lot more to talk about, maybe, maybe I'll sort of hand back over, but the, the one other thing I, I, was, I was just sort of um, thinking about there is the difference between, so I guess what, what we've seen over the last couple of years is a lot more, um, a lot of new businesses uh, taking impact investment, early stage impact investment, where they have a very robust ESG framework, but there actually isn't a great deal of innovation or they're not solving sort of deeper impact problems. So they're ticking a lot of boxes, taking ESG investments. So for the impact investor, box ticked. For the company, they've found finance, but perhaps there's a question around whether that those funds are finding their way to truly impactful businesses. I think that's a really, really important point. And, you know, for the Impact Investing Institute, obviously we are committed to growing the market, but not at any price and growing the market with integrity. And so actually that brings me on to a, um, a kind of, uh, you know, all of, all of you are manifesting both sides, you know, commercial and impact integrity. And actually there was an FT article about 10 days ago um, about ESG as the next mis-selling scandal. And, you know, we see the disciplines of impact investing, intentionality, measurability, additionality, as the corrective to that. And I wanted to, you know, you've already touched on it, Ben, a bit um, about how you would, well, the potential danger for the market um, being somewhat misdirected. but. What do you think we could do to make sure it scales with integrity? And I'm going to ask that question to Simon first, because um, I know you have views here. Yeah, um, the concept of greenwashing, every single meeting that I uh, present the fund on, that word is used um, in a not necessarily accusatory fashion. <laughs> but actually that's good, because that's shining a light on the dark recess of this kind of concept. Mm. And the more that gets asked, the more we're going to be held to task in delivering. Now, the other thing that we're doing in the bond market, particularly through ICMA, I sit on the social bond, uh, social and green bond um, working parties there, is to try and make the structure of those bonds much more robust. So we've got this concept of use of proceeds, principles, etc., that we follow, but also we're developing that into the actual impact itself. So there is verification of the disbursement of the monies that we give these people, but we're now developing the idea of confirmation from the target population that, that we're targeting through survey evidence as part of the framework that you have within um, green bonds. Um, I think the area I'm most worried about within the bond market are actually sustainability linked bonds, mm. which are not use of proceeds bonds. These are general corporate purposes uh, where they have KPIs. I wanted to call them KPI linked bonds. I got out voted on that because I think it's very confusing. Sustainability bonds are not sustainability linked bonds, but their companies themselves are setting the targets, the KPIs, and in some cases we've seen that 90% of those targets have been achieved by the time the bond is issued. 60% mm. reduction in, in scope one and two emissions in that particular case. Mm. That worries me because actually what we want is the robustness of the structures to make sure that this doesn't happen. We don't get accused of greenwashing, social washing, rainbow washing, which is SDG washing because mm. of the coloured boxes, etc. But actually by asking those questions, by being scrutinised by the market, it's actually a bit like the scientific approach, whereby the scrutiny of the market is applied mm. to these sorts of things. Now those are public markets, so you can do that a lot more easily. But nevertheless, we're still working to make those particular issues themselves more robust. And what we do in analysing them is we go much, much further than that. So we're looking at additionality, we're looking at particularly the primary market, that's where a borrower will actually borrow the money, spend that in society, and that's where and when and how impact is achieved. So we're looking at the primary market specifically as impact. We're also looking at a focus on deprivation. We think it's a more intense social outcome 
if it focuses on deprived communities within society. And thirdly, and most importantly, the quality of impact reporting is the other thing that we look at through the fund. So Simon, you're, I mean, you've evidenced there the sort of the rigour of the Columbia approach and how you're matching you know, how the fund is positioned with actual sort of underlying systems. And Daniela, obviously you're playing more in the private markets. Could you speak a little bit to the innovation of you as a fund manager really delivering on both fronts and what it means in practice for those mainstream actors who are coming into this space who want to have an impact product? You know, what does a good impact fund manager look like and how does it look different to, you know, BAU fund manager, why? Yeah, I think, I think the, the, the challenge is always to go beyond that and with robust systems and processes. And, and I think the three criteria that you mentioned of intentional impact, measurable impact, an additional impact, meaning, you know, is really, is this something? And we look particularly at Snowball, we look for, you know, is this a good business opportunity that is intentional? Uh, is this an, innov an innovation or is this providing a solution, but with that intention to achieving positive social and environmental impact, then is it additional to something that would have happened anyway, which they talks to Simon's primary market there. And uh, is it measurable? Can we measure it over time? Can we report and engage with stakeholders? And, and those things can all be reported. And I think the more we are transparent and communicate with investors, and the more we standardize the way that we talk about those things, frameworks. So for example, we use the impact management uh, project framework which is becoming the standard in the, in the industry and we urge everybody to kind of go and use those standardized ways of, of engaging with impact because otherwise what you're making is the investor having the effort to understand your methodology rather than being able to compare different providers and how they're executing on their strategies. We worked with the impact management project to develop the next level which is how do we manage, how do we assess the impact on the fund manager itself. And so at Snowball, we look at impact in three levels. So we look at the enterprise impact, which is the company on the ground doing the work. And in private markets, this is, this is easier to measure than in public markets in some respects. Uh, and we also have public markets investment. So we're, we're multi-asset, we go across, across the board. Uh, then the second one is, um, is the fund manager impact and on that we look at, at about you know, things like the mission and behaviours. You know, are they really committed to impact and is this just words or do they have processes to back that up? Do they manage impact rather than just you know, report on impact mm -hmm. after the fact? You know, and do they drive this? Do they look at the risk of impact not, not happening? Are they catalytic as investors? Which a lot of times means, are they flexible in the way that they provide capital? Are they looking to build the ecosystem? And, uh, and how do they contribute to the underlying uh, companies? And then thirdly, we look at our own impact and contribution, which mainly happens through that engagement, being very active engage, engagement, with the fund managers themselves. And so in that sense, I think one distinction of what we've seen of our approach, and more people are beginning to do this as well, uh, is that we not only look at all these impact criteria and score them uh, for the due diligence and, and uh, introducing the fund into the portfolio, but act, and not only when you report it back, but also throughout the holding period. So we, we use impact data real time and feedback, uh, use those feedback loops to manage and make decisions and together with performance data, of course, and to uh, decide whether, you know, what to do with that investment, basically. Very impressive depth of systems and approach and a, a rigor that as new players come in, they could certainly learn from. So thank you, Daniela. And thinking now on the kind of enterprise side, so investors like Simon and Daniela are creating all of these kind of systems and approaches <coughs> to make it more rigorous. But Emmanuel, coming back to you, if you know, you're 
taking on this kind of finance or interacting with this market, what would you like to see more of um, from the social investment and impact investing community? What would help you in your work and, and organisations like you? Um, I suppose there are two major things that come to mind. Obviously, one is terms, favourable terms would be helpful. Um, but I think it's also important for impact investors to compare themselves to what the alternatives might be for an organisation like ours. So we're often in this slightly odd situation where we would love to work with impact investors and social investors to fund future buildings and the work that we do, but the terms are less favourable than what we'd get from a, um, a high street bank. Um, so we're in a sort of odd position where we have to think about our business model and it being viable at the same time as wanting to work with an organisation that's investing in us um, for the right reasons. So I think it's really important for um, organisations to consider that. Um, the other thing, and I think this was highlighted in the report um, <coughs> when, it spoke, uh, when it spoke about um, uh, the uh, BAME-led organisations and uh, the degree to which they're successful with investing. And I think that we need to have a conversation about who gets social investment and why and what sorts of organisations um, uh, get that sort of uh, investment. Um, what I found from the work I do interacting with other organisations that are led by BAME people is that those sorts of organisations tend to have emerged from a slightly different space um, compared to other organisations, tend to be structured in slightly different ways. We were very much structured in a different way because of how we um, were set up. There was some complexity to it. Um, we had um, a really great partner in Treebeard and that they were willing to lean into that complexity and re recognise that there was actually some innovation to it, whereas other organisations simply saw it as being risky. Um, so I, I think just really thinking really carefully about the terms that are, are offered and, uh, and how that might compare to um, uh, other types of uh, investment. Uh, and also really thinking carefully about the types of organisations that you're working with. And really trying to understand those organisations and get a, r a real understanding as to where the risks are because they're, they're not necessarily always um, apparent. And that's really well said and actually in the um in the report, we highlight the social investment business diversity dashboards, which does show that the, the sector is really lagging on its diversity approach and people of colour less likely to get loan finance than Caucasian people. And what does that mean for the sector and how can we challenge ourselves to answer it? So well said. And, and Ben, you know, for you interacting with this market, are there changes that you would want to see, you know, either in terms of the investors that you're interacting with or more from a regulatory perspective? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, um, I guess, yeah, we will tend to sort of see things through the, the lens of our kind of objectives and priorities. But, you know, the IPCC's report this um, week, this week, you know, does remind us that, you know, there are perhaps um, priorities when you look across the whole kind of um, range of impact um, objectives and, um, and and I guess for for ourselves and for our investors some clearer signposting around future legislation some more ambition um, I guess you know the government sort of has to ask itself a question um, all governments have to ask themselves a question around whether they really believe that um, sustainability, environmental sustainability offers a new industrial revolution or the foundations for a new industrial revolution or whether it's a nice thing to kind of attach their name to and I, I, I don't, I think for some there's, there's a high level of conviction and for others there's not really but the, the I mean you know in our field uh, there are, there are a few measures around, there's a plastics tax arriving this year there's um, something called extended producer responsibility, which will um, put a charge on the producers of um, um, pa packaging. So, if a, if a food brand, a food brand will have to pick up um, more of a cost for the disposal and recycling of the packaging that they produce. But the, the, the numbers are not big. They're not really going to change behaviour, and uh, and you know they. The, the, the market's always one step ahead. So as an example, um, for extended producer responsibility, um, there are exemptions if you use a certain amount of recycled content in the packaging. But the, what, what's now happening is there are um, factories, um, various parts of the world that are creating recycled plastic because the market offers a better price for that recycled plastic. 
and really there are limitations to the recycling process anyway. So, it, you know, it requires, I think, a, a deeper level of commitment, um, bigger incentives, uh, you know, you need to level the playing field. Uh, Bill Gates has talked a lot about this idea of a green premium. Mm -hmm. I think for a lot of businesses that are trying to create a more environmentally sustainable solution, there are additional costs. You can reach a kind of, you know, you can reach a sort of Tesla buying market that will be able to afford that premium, but you can't necessarily reach a mainstream market. So you, I think for a lot of businesses like ourselves, you're trying to feel your way to a more mainstream market, you know, building some scale, getting some economies, but more legislative pressure. But I can see it's really difficult because you're also talking about a just transition. So we can't suddenly start affording, start imposing greater costs on um, households that are already struggling. So, you know, there's some, some very tough decisions ahead for society, but, um, but personally, yeah, finding more ways to reward and incentivize investors who are putting money into, from my perspective, early stage businesses, um, you know, that have um, clear, measurable um, su sustainability improvements in terms of sustainability impacts is, is, is key. Yeah, that's <coughs> it's really well said. And, and while we at the Impact Investing Institute are thinking about, you know, what is the enabling policy environment for this approach to investing, of course, environmental legislation, social legislation that frames the market in which you're playing is such a vital part of pushing the whole system forward. So that's well said. And thinking about just um, for those of you on at Zoom at home, um, if you keep getting your questions in, because shortly we will invite Penny back on stage and um, we can start firing questions at everyone as well, not just me, Chair's prerogative. Um, but, you know, what, one of the areas that we think is um, uh, kind of ripe for advocacy to unlock this wave of institutional investment is issues around, for example, fiduciary duty, so that pension funds, despite the fact that impact investing is compatible with a risk-adjusted market rate return, there is still, despite 58 billion and the prospects of growth, you know, we're still, as you say, at 1%. Um, what kind of market financial, um, sort of financial policy change um, would this group welcome? And I don't know if Daniela or Simon, you want to... Danielle has gone first, so there's an intake of breath. <laughs> she goes first. So I think the, the definition of fiduciary duty is very narrow. Mm -hmm. um, and it assumes that, so fiduciary duty is the obligation of, of managing for the benefit of a third party. And there is an assumption that maximizing profit at any maximizing returns at any cost is, is fulfilling your fiduciary duty. And I think that is very, very narrow uh, a way of looking at it. I don't know about any of you, but in 30 years of contributing to pension funds, I was never asked. Mm -hmm. Has anybody been asked <laughs> of what their preferred benefit is? So I, I think... That was a quiet no yeah. from the audience. <laughs> so, I think, so I think we need to rethink because the financial, market, financial markets cannot operate in a vacuum. We are in society and all of that needs to be taken into account. So you maximize return and by the time you retire, then the world is destroyed. I'm exaggerating obviously, but you know, where are you going to spend your, or your maximum returns? So I do think that there is something about fiduciary duty that we need to be clearer about mm -hmm. and, and, and broader about. And it's still, you know, of course, it's still, you know, you need to create wealth. You still to need to be, you know, all the principles still need to be there. But I do think that we need to sort of relook at that. I think, you know, uh, with that, I think there will be a, a big, <laughs> could be a big change in terms of pension mm -hmm. funds investing in this area. Uh, because you're right, I think there is still a perception as well that, uh, that impact investing, somehow you're compromising uh, on returns. Mm -hmm. And if you look at you know, the, the strategies and if you look, of course, we don't have 100 years of data to, to back this up. But if you look at what's been happening, you actually can see that risk adjusted market returns can be achieved with a social and environmental, you know, positive impact. 
Yeah, and we have, um, just to give a shout out to the Impact Investing Institute's Learning Hub. I was going to do that. We have, I was going to do that for you. That would have been much more dignified. Uh, there are five, Simon, there do you know where there's a good information <laughs> on risk <laughs> it's, it's in the report. There were five um, city law firms that contributed to this. Yeah. And a publication from the Impact Investing Institute, which you can find on the website, <laughs> referred to in the document itself. <clears throat> but it's really important because we've had these opinions about the fiduciary duty of trustees. Trustees are in a difficult position because they have to take advice and in some ways they're almost obliged to take advice and that advice coming from consultants etc etc relies on legal process of maximizing the pensioner benefits actually that goes much wider than the financial and this is referred to here mm. but it's not necessarily obvious to a trustee through a consultant and certainly not obvious to consultants um, that actually there is a wider um, debate here and that's four trillion that pension fund market mm. four trillion of assets under management if we can just get them to recognize that there's more than just a financial return as part of your fiduciary duty as set out in the impact investing <laughs> institute's report then we're getting somewhere we're getting somewhere mm -hmm. well that's really really helpful thank you and one of the other kind of drivers that towards the end of the report and penny flushed up um, in her penultimate slide is around this sort of standardization theme that comes through, you know, we're still 15 years on since it was first framed at Bellagio, you know, what is impact investing? And I can't imagine how many times you've had to answer that question. <laughs> but, you know, things like um, the FCA's disclosure and labeling advisory group, the social taxonomy, um, uh, What's your published what yes, yesterday? The EU social tax. Do you want to speak to that a bit, Simon? Just uh, what your it's about that. It's about that thick. Um, but the social taxonomy obviously follows on from the green taxonomy. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, we can't do it in a science-based way for social. It has to be on a norms-based approach. Um, and there are certain aspects of it that have been a compromise, let's say. Um, but what we what we thought about originally in the draft was we thought about the entity level and the activity level, so-called mm -hmm. vertical and horizontal. But actually that, that plays very nicely into the way that we think about ESG and impact. Because the way that we think about ESG is basically doing the thing right, whereas impact is doing the right thing. And if you think about the internal management practices, how they manage their business at the entity level, that's doing the thing right. Mm. But the effect of a business on wider communities, wider society, wider economies, that's doing the right thing, mm. hopefully doing the right thing. And that's the activity level. So actually it does play into the way that we talk about things. So we talk about ESG and impact building up a much more uh, across that spectrum of, uh, of approaches, which again is, is, is highlighted mm. once again in this report, moving across from negative exclusion, best in class, those kinds of aspects, through to sustainability, sustainable outcomes, and right at, at the end, impact, and further. Because mm. when you do start to sacrifice financial returns, that's altruistic, that's philanthropic, mm. that's charitable endeavor. And as two enterprises who are, not, who are both doing the right thing and doing the thing right, you know, what does this, you know, I'm, I, I'm struck by both of you are really challenging an established mainstream market that is dysfunctional in both of your domains. You know, what does partnership with investors to grow actually mean for the issues you're impacting into? Emmanuel first, like what would it mean for every single care home to be a home <coughs> rather than the system as it currently stands? Well, it, it's, it's transformational. And when we look at the statistics, we can see what the impact would look like. So 49% um, of our young offenders are children who are care experienced, but only 0.6% of children are care experienced. About 25% of homeless people are people who um, are care experienced as well. And there's a really direct line between the outcomes of children in care, particularly those in children's homes, and lots of the other social issues that we're trying to address. And if we're able to address those issues in a way that is, is caring and ensures that we, we do the right thing, um, then the outcomes will be you know, absolutely incredible. And we can see that when we visit homes that are, that are doing some really great work. I see it when I look at um, homes in Germany and Denmark, the children over there are no different from the children over here, but we really do not see the problematic social outcomes in those countries that we do in the UK. So there's a really great potential to do things um, differently. But in order to do that, I think we need 
two things. Uh, one thing is, is patience, patience from investors, patient investment. Um, and the other thing is flexibility um, as well, uh, and a recognition that one size isn't going to fit all. Um, organizations are going to need different things over time. An early stage organization needs very different things from an organization that's established. But if we're able to get all those things right, then the, um, the transformational potential for our most vulnerable young children is incredible. And Ben, what does groceries with zero waste mean for the UK, mean for the planet? If, this, if your model was to dominate like Tesco's dominates now, what, does, what would that mean for us? Um, uh, well, quite, quite a few things, um, but I, I, I mean, you know, we're not the only solution to tackling um, packaging um, or, you know, the, the solution that we're devising is not the only way of addressing the problem with packaging waste and plastic pollution. Um, you know, there are, there are so many um, different, there are going to be so many different solutions for different parts of the market, for different geographies, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, first, I guess you've got to sort of you've got to sort of start costing the externalities. So, on a practical level, in London, for household waste management, between now and the end of the decade, it's going to cost roughly five billion pounds um, a year. So, actually, we're all paying for crap packaging already. So, um, so maybe you know there, there are already some initiatives for those um, waste management companies to start funding businesses like, like our own, which is interesting. But I think if you, you, know, you, you can start to join up some of the dots and start to apply some of these costs to the polluters, then you do start to, to level the playing field. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I guess it's, you know, we're a tiny company really in the grand scheme of things. Um, but if we do believe as the IPCC um, said, you know, more explicitly this week than they have before, that this is the final decade where we can make a difference, then for what we're doing and for what a number of other companies are doing, um, the transformation needs to happen now. So probably the companies that are going to oversee that transition are already up and running and they need more investment. Mm. And, um, and yeah, you know, I guess, um, you know, when, when are we going to accept that that's true? I don't really know. You know well, still, I, you know. I don't know if it was, I was about to say, a wise man told me recently, it might have been you. <laughs> so a wise Ben may have told me recently that he couldn't see a company IPOing in five years' time that didn't have a, a powerful sustainability proposition that wasn't not only doing the thing right, but doing the right thing. So on that note, I'd like to invite Penny, someone who always does the right thing, to come to the <laughs> stage, because um, we're going to turn to the Q&A. Um, Swati's got some good questions, I hear. So maybe Swati, do you want to kick us off while um, uh, Lizzie will be roaming with the mic in the room? So Swati, do you have some questions that you want to um, relay from the Zoom? Thank you. Uh, yes, so the first one I think is to Penny. It's from Karen Shackleton. Uh, did you do any analysis of the split between environmentally focused impact funds and socially focused funds? No. It's too, just way too, fine a, way too fine a cut to make. Though it sh we should say that in the report there is a breakdown of um, according to the SDGs of the primary investment areas. Yeah, that's a good so point. there was a, yeah. I'm going to put you on the spot now while yeah, I flick three, through the, the report. Three, yeah, the thing that SDGs we think of have really had a massive impact on transforming investment themes and the three ones that, that were the most popular that were cited were healthcare, um, equality and, um, and the environment. Yeah, sustainable cities and communities. Yeah. So we didn't have a breakdown um, specifically, but lots of good content about where people are investing and, and also the groups. Can, that I, can I just say, oh, running, yes, running a social bond fund that you would think is 100% focused on the social, if we get the environment wrong, we're going to create the massive social problems in yeah. the future. I think that's an almost an arbitrary distinction these days. I like to see the coming together of the E and the S in ESG. We saw the rise of the S yeah, principally point. through the pandemic. I think now we're seeing the coming together. Equally, if we get it right, 
is going to cost a lot of money and we need to make sure that that cost is not borne by those in society least able to afford it. So the social of the environmental, the environmental of the social. Mm -hmm. Any other questions of the Zoom, Swati, that you want to? Yes, actually, I think in the discussion we touched upon a few other questions that are raised in the Zoom. Um, there is one more question that I will go to before going to the live audience. This is from uh, John Franklin. The quality of assessment of impact can be varied. Was there an assessment of the quality of impact investment work or the outcomes it has actually delivered in the, in the research? But also to all the panelists, maybe this second part of the question, what would need to happen to make that feasible? Mm. So I think to Penny first, just in kind of addressing the factual question and then to the, to the groups, what would support better detailing of social and environmental outcomes for investors? So, so the question was specifically around verification of outcomes. Yes, so uh, the quality of the impact achieved or the impact of the outcomes delivered. Um, the, the module two where we did bottom-up analysis of um, participants in the sector what we did is we very specifically analyzed funds that were designated impact exactly what they were invested into and then mapped that against the original kind of investment thesis or intent. So that was done for about 200 <coughs> funds very specifically. As far as looking at the specific outcomes, that's still relatively a open area in terms of being able to absolutely have a quantitative evidence, here's the exact outcome. Um, I think that's an important journey that we're still on, but it's one that um, is, is, is a bit catch as catch can at this point. And actually just to chip in, I mean, as I think Penny made clear in her overarching <coughs> remarks, this is a first stake in the ground, this attempt to size the market. And we spent a lot of time following the capital flows all the way through to try and reach <coughs> beneficiaries. But ultimately, our main focus was the on flow. kind of getting the 58 billion. But interrogate, ultimately, that's where we want <coughs> to get to. You know, what is the quality of impact that 58 billion is delivering? Um, but if this was complicated, that gets a lot more complicated. But ideas from the panel on how we make the kind of sharing of real world outcomes back to investors simpler more um, transparent i don't know if anyone wants to, i've got a i've got simon then daniela i'm going to pick up on something daniela said earlier actually because we map each and every bond to um, impact management projects abc <coughs> classifications that's a act to avoid harm b benefit stakeholders c contribute to solutions in addition we also map each and every bond to in fact, not the 17 SDGs, but 169 targets that underlie those 17 SDGs. Why? Because exactly what Dan Daniela said, you want to be able to compare. Mm -hmm. What we do within the fund and within the impact report is we're talking about social intensity, a proprietary way of looking at the intensity of the social outcomes. But you can't compare that with other people. So that's why we map to what we think is becoming the common language of impact and what has become the common language of sustainability, the SDGs. Daniela. One of the things that we do, the way that we feel that we can do, the, you know, that we can better map this is by getting our fund managers into, you know, to task. So basically we monitor how they monitor and how they drive and manage the impact on the underlying companies. And then we also look at the companies ourselves. So we have a sort of a, a double way in a way of, of looking at that impact and the intensity of impact. And what we do is we have about, I would say about 80 different categories that we score against and we score both the enterprise and the fund manager against best practice. And this has all been peer reviewed as well uh, and, and worked with. And then once that score is, once we have a score for the enterprise and a score for the manager, we aggregate them into a bullseye score that allows us to talk about the intensity of our whole portfolio, the impact intensity of the portfolio. And for the investor, which is your question, how can the investor compare? For the investor to look at the impact, it's a very easy way to look at the aggregate because we're multi-asset. So unlike Simon that is, is, is focused in one asset class, 
for us to kind of compare apples and bananas, you know, this is the only way that we can allow the investor a simple way to look, look at that and query us. And so it's very interesting, the center of the bullseye is a five. And it's not a lot of our, our portfolio that is on the five. So it's a great question when someone say, well, you know, you're so focused, you have all these things, why is not a lot of your portfolio on a five? To get to that level of intensity of impact and track record and longevity of that impact is what get, gets you a five, is not every investment. So then we can talk about the difference of impact in the different asset classes, in the different uh, ways that you can achieve that. So I think from an investor perspective, the more we have those common frameworks that make it easier for the investor to understand and query, most importantly, and the more transparent we are. So for example, all our methodology is published on our website. We have the impact reports there with the methodology because for us, you know, we want the whole ecosystem to grow and learn and whoever can benefit from that, great. And just to Emmanuel and Ben, because obviously there's a sort of <coughs> data chain which starts with the asset owner, comes through Daniela, comes through a fan <laughs> manager and it all lands dunk, on your desk. So how, you know, how would you like investors to think about outcomes? Because obviously if they're oriented to the same outcomes you are, that's good and you're all aligned. But it's a bit of a faff, all of this impact data collection. You know, how, how do you make it useful, helpful for you, helpful for the investors? And how can we sort of align be behind sort of meaningful, helpful outcomes? And that's to, to um, Emmanuel first and then Ben, if you've got thoughts. Yeah, I suppose um, I recall a time when I was um, doing my research and I was out in Finland and I visited an organisation that works with um, young people have left care over uh, uh, a number of years and I was having a conversation with the, the leaders of the organisation about um, uh, their impact and I asked them about you know, how often they're expected to report on um, the impact that they're having and they said you know, you know, they may report after about five years um, and you know, sort of was slightly astounded by that and um, asked them to explain why and, and, and what they said made perfect sense. Sometimes Especially, especially given the work that they're doing, it can take that long for them to see the impact that they're going to have. You know, we are working with quite young people in order for us to really understand whether what we're doing is effective. We do have to take a very long-term approach. I caveat that by saying we do have a lot of um, impact measurement in place that looks at what's happening over the short term. Um, but it does remind us that um, a lot of uh, the impact measurement that we're expected to do is only looking at things um, over a year or two years. And really, we need to really think about how things um, look over the long term. The other thing is um, we have to be, I think, really careful about um, what we're measuring, and who we're measuring, how and why. Um, we are, we've only got a single children's home. We can only look after, after six children um, at any one time. That's a really small sample group. And things are going to be very different for each one of um, that child, those children if we just adopt the measures that um, other organisations would take. It's very easy to, to skew it. So we have to take a very qualitative, intensive approach to us really trying to understand how, how to do that. We, we sort of um, counter that by having external um, evaluators as well who do come in and tell us whether what we're doing is um, impactful as well. But I think we just have to be really flexible and really understanding that different things are going to work for different organisations. We also have to um, be able to look at things over a very long period of time as well because sometimes it takes that long to see the impact. Really helpful. And actually, Ben, I've just noticed the time, so I, I don't. I, I, maybe if there are questions in the room to take. Um. Thank you very much to the excellent speakers and panels for the very insightful discussion. Uh, I wanted to ask what is your view on the role of public markets versus private markets in driving impact? Particularly looking at, uh, I guess, two things uh, as one, I guess, more anecdotal example, a lot of um, social funds are often exposed to, um, for example, housing associations and or utilities, which I guess are only two aspects of the broader impact perspective. Uh, and second as well, con in consideration of the oftentimes higher transaction costs that public market participation requires of companies. Thank so you. I think, Daniela, you're probably best as a multi-asset manager to answer that question. So if I, if I take a step back, I think we will only win in the objective. And I think the objective is that we allow every investor to understand the impact of every investment. 
So if we kind of think that the whole market needs to, be, needs to start to measure the impact, its impact, every asset class needs to win in that sense. <laughs> so it has to work for every asset class. That being said, we find that private markets have a more, it's easier to control and direct the impact there. So uh, we, from our experience, find that, for example, in, in terms of public equities, you know, when you have a lot of secondary markets, you don't have that additionality as you have when you're, when you're uh, giving a new product or service to an underserved population, for example, in a private market. So I think, you know, to your question, yes, so far in our experience, we've had more impact and seen more impact in the private markets. That being said, I think the provision of public markets has improved dramatically in the last five years and the quality and of the, you know, you just heard what Simon was saying about, you know, the, the bond market and what he's doing, his fund, you know, the quality and the integrity of that, of that impact is improving as well. So that, that would be my caveat. Any more questions from the floor? There's um, Caroline over there. Oh, sorry, there's the match oh, there. I got overexcited. <laughs> okay, over there and then Caroline. Um, hi, my name is Kieran from Taylor Vinters. I've got a question to the investees on the panel, so Emmanuel and Ben. Is it important to you to have impact investors on the cap table? And if that's the case, why is that? Is it because the, the, the capital itself? Is it the mentoring? Is it the networks? Or is it because they're aligned to your social impact for the business? Thank you. Um, well, I, I guess um, there, there probably is a, a better fit for, um, for a business like us that there was uh, a greater value placed on the impact outcomes and probably a uh, slightly different approach in terms of the balance of um, looking at commercial and impact outcomes and probably a more patient approach generally. Uh, so um, I think, I mean, what we've tried to do at every stage is to balance the investment coming in um, with impact and more commercial general investors. Uh, I guess it, it sort of puts some good disciplines around how the business reports and operates generally. Um, but. Um, uh, but I think it, increasingly it also provides um, an avenue to longer term impact capital as well. So for us, I think building a network within that world is really important and, and definitely seen a real growth in terms of climate tech impact investing. I guess it, it comes under slightly different names, but there is an increase in the number of funds and um, the quantity of capital available through those funds. So, yeah. Emmanuel, would you like to... Sorry, can I just um, ask you to repeat the question? I don't think I quite... Uh... Um, yeah, I was wondering, um, what is it important to you to have impact investors on the cap table? Or if so, why is that? What's your dream to do this? Can you clarify what cap table is? I think yeah, we don't, probably don't have one <laughs> yeah, in our organisation. Yeah, I suppose what would make us different is because we're, we're a charity, so a charitable organisation, and we also sit within a wider charity um, group. Um, so we have a project committee as opposed to a, a, a cap table, and it's the body that essentially oversees the, the work that we're going to do. And if we were um, an independent organisation, it would be um, the trustee board. Um, with um, our main investor, we did have them on that decision-making board um, for a, a period of time, it's really beneficial to have their involvement, especially since we started the work on the project just as COVID hit. Um, and having them um, sort of go through the process of trying to manage a complicated building project whilst um, the world seems to be falling down around us was really beneficial. Um, they were also able to make um, connections to um, other people who were able to um, help in a range of different ways. And that was supposed to last essentially until the point we, uh, which we opened. We decided to keep them on there because they actually brought a, a wealth of knowledge and expertise 
um, to the table um, as well. So it's been really beneficial to do that. And I think it sort of um, enhances the idea of us working in partnership with an organisation rather than simply being um, the uh, recipients of um, social uh, investment and um, you know, that partnership working is being able to negotiate around um, certain things and getting additional support if that's ever needed um, and required. So I hope that sort of answers that question. Can um, I add in one oh, second? Yes. Sorry. Just from a, complete, a different angle, uh, at Snowball, we often are, at, you know, the funds, of course, we, we do all the due diligence and everything, but um, the funds are so keen that we become investors in them that often we go below their minimum amount. We're allowed to get in into below the minimum amount simply because of the process and the time that we spend in sort of helping them to improve their impact processes. So there is a that angle too. Brilliant. Caroline, sorry, desperate <coughs> to get to this question for Cameron. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, hello. Um, I'm approaching this from two oh, sorry, I'm from the Esme Fairbend Foundation, um, who've been involved in social investment for a long, long time and also in impact investing and ESG. Um, and but also I chair the investment committee for the Environment Agency Pension Fund. Um, and I just want to talk about two things, uh, or ask two things. One is um, the investment culture right now um, is not fit for purpose for impact. It, it, likes, it likes a framework, it likes a taxonomy, it likes things neat, it likes to measure quantity, um, not outcomes. And I was really struck by, um, uh, you know, Ben and Emmanuel, your point about flexibility and patience, because change is really messy. <laughs> it doesn't sit in a nice, neat framework. Uh, the real world doesn't sit in a nice framework. Um, and so I just wondered, uh, also it needs new expertise. So the expertise that you have in your areas is absolutely crucial in order to make a properly effective investment. So my question to the panel is, do you think the impact investing, well, any investing, aspect has got the right culture, because this is cultural, it's not legal. A fiduciary duty, your pension fund is absolutely to act in the best interests of your members, full stop. That is the primary fiduciary duty. So um, I just wondered if really we're having the wrong conversation here and that this is actually about how do you, how do you change the investment world to respond to the challenges of these two excellent men, <laughs> um, rather than how do they respond and how do they adapt to the existing investment system. Mm. Really can powerful I, point. And I actually, I think it's our last question, so to oh. Simon and Daniela. Can I pick up on two question. things there. The, the, the first is, massive part of what we do is engagement. I'm a bondholder, a stakeholder, I don't own companies, but it's a massive part of it. If I, my, my actual <laughs> job title actually transcends asset classes, but Engagement is a, is a really, really important thing. What I worry about is people saying the number of meetings that we had last, last month was 30. We've done it, we've done the engagement. It's not about that, it's about the quality of engagement. Through that engagement, having influence, and hopefully through that influence, changing things so that you create an impact. Um, with an equity hat on, that, that's the way that I would view things. What worries me is, as you say, the culture of tick boxing the number of meetings we had, et cetera, et cetera. And the other thing I wanted to pick up on was the, 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 the lower cost of bank funding. I don't see that as a problem because what I want those banks that are providing lower cost funding to do is put those projects in a social bond and issue a social bond to me so that I can then access those small and medium sized entities that may not be big enough to issue a bond in their own right. What these, thing, what these banks are doing is they're aggregators. They're basically lending small and borrowing big and you can borrow big in the bond market, but I can follow the money through to the on-lending, either through the Charities Aid Foundation's Charity Bank or THFC in the housing association sector. But we need aggregators because what you don't necessarily want to do is borrow 200, 250 million pounds every time to issue into the bond market. So we need those aggregators. Daniela, do you want to respond to Caroline's more the kind of cultural change needed within the investment community to really start to take from 1% to 99% in terms of impact investment allocated? I couldn't agree more with Caroline. And I would say that largely the culture is not there. I think in, uh, it's, it's still very cookie cutter and still, to be honest, 
I think, very exploitative. You know, when you know, the financial markets as a whole use uh, in nature and society as inputs to itself, you know, to move more money, to create more money. And I think that is the fundamental issue that we need to change. And, you know, not to, to sort of, you know, uh, when I joined Snowball, so it was not my creation. One of the things that I thought was the most admirable is the governance structure that we have. We're our mission, you know, locked in and, and all of that. But also the remuneration structure that we have. Because, you know, the moment that we start to break even in our fund, our, our management fees go down and the benefits of the return go back to investors, not to the fund managers. There is a limit, we need to rethink the whole system. And flexibility is one, catalytic capital is another. So for example, we invest in a sustainable forestry project and fund. You know, that cannot be a five year project. That has to be a 25 year project. You know, so unless, but, but again, the 10 to 12, you know, you know, sort of a fixed mentality. We are an evergreen fund. A lot of people are like, but wait a minute, your GPLP, your evergreen, oh, it doesn't fit. And to, I think one of you two said something, it's kind of a lack of, it's a laziness, almost, not to be able to understand like the Three Bear Trust did with you, what is actually, the, there is more complexity and investors need to step up and I think the financial markets need to step up to what is actually needed for us to make the change because otherwise we're going to be just rearranging the deck chairs in the Titanic here. I think a lot of the tweaking, <coughs> a lot of things that happen are tweaking which mean that you know you change a bit so that you don't have to change for real. So on that slightly more pessimistic note oh, than I was sorry. hoping to end on. I um, am so sorry. Uh, no, no, not at all. You know, at the Institute we're aiming for she capital markets <laughs> to be fairer and work better for people and planet. And I think, I think we're at time, Swati. Oh, Penny, I'm sorry. I think we're at time though, Penny, unless you... No. Oh, oh. Um, yeah, no, there was a gentleman in the back who was waving. Oh, I'm, I, I think we're out of time for questions because we're, we're, we're three minutes over. Um, so, um, I've got to yeah. get to King's Cross. So yes. And you've got to get to King's Cross and there's a tube strike on. So with that, I just wanted to say thank you so much to my panellists here, um, Ben, Emmanuel, Simon, Daniela, to the team at EY who've been unbelievable partners and real, um, uh, uh, who've, who've who've taken this journey with us and delivered a really wonderful uh, report. To our funders at DCMS and Big Society Capital, we're very grateful to you. Um, in, um, within my team, Swati Pajaris uh, work very closely on this. Lizzie Robbins and George Salmon here have made the report beautiful and the event seamless considering all of the complexity. Um, and obviously Toynbee Hall um, and Audio Hire, we're, we're very grateful. And thank you to all of you who contributed to the report, those who filled in the too long survey, um, who contributed case studies and who were interviewed, we're, we're really grateful. Thank you so much. There's coffee, food, did someone say cake? Oh, cake. Um, um, so thank you so much, enjoy the report and we'll see you in 2027 for a much larger Impact investing sector. Thank you.